Hey everybody, Resident Loser Jeremy here. This one is a treat. I had Warren David, Grammy winning, Dove winning, all around cool guy come up and talk. And what was interesting was I genuinely have a lot of his mixes as mix refs. <laughs> Super gracious guy really infectious and his like passion for music. I was super pumped to get to talk to him. I'm super excited for you guys to take a listen. This is a longer one, kind of like a podcast style. Let me know if you like this type of video. This is a longer one, so I recommend putting it on while you're gonna do something else around the studio and just listen, because there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of insight here. Thank you to Warren for coming. Let's get to it. Rolling, rolling. I forgot my coffee. <laughs> Shadows and so. There's those lights, the quasar tubes. Those mm -hmm. are so cheap and they take up like no space. Right. This. I don't think I would do something like that. Mm -hmm. I might create like a Lico situation. Yeah, I have no that, idea. Lighting is like my weakest. Uh, I, I was a theater tech minor. Were you so, really? Yeah. So I, I learned I all the theater. <laughs> I, I, I know very little now. But. I'm here with Warren David, uh, up and coming, hopeful uh, mixer, producer out of the Nashville area. Let's take a look at some of these credits here. I don't know if anybody's heard of any of them. Uh, Keith Urban, Darius Rucker, <laughs> Ben Richter, Josh Groban, uh, Lady A. They were, were they Lady Antebellum and then they changed their name? Or is it different? So it was Lady Antebellum and then it was Lady A. Okay. Uh, Charles, Ke Charles Kelly from Lady A. Okay. Yeah. Lauren Daigle, Maverick City Music, Phil Wickham, Brandon Lake, Crowder. For King and Country, We the Kingdom, Bethel, Hillsong, Danny Goki, Sean Curran, Tomlin. You know, I think if you put your head down and really get to work, I, I think you'll make it, man. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but seriously, it's, it's not often you get to sit and talk to somebody who has had a hand in so much stuff in my mix ref playlist. Mm. And not just mine, but stuff that people send me that they want to be considered to sound like for their records from mm. a production standpoint, from a mix standpoint. So it's clear you've had a hand in like affecting the industry in a very positive and meaningful way. And not just that, you're a Grammy winner, Dove winner, Atmos mixer, you're involved with a killer speaker company, Dutch and Dutch. All that aside, let's start with the heavy hitting question here. Uh, this is going to set the tone for the rest of the talk. Um, what is the best Pop-Tart flavor and why is it cookies and cream? Mm. Uh, why are you wrong? <laughs> and well, I'll just say I'm I'm grateful for that list and to be a part of those things. And it's humbling to af affect people the way that you're talking about it. So I, because I've felt I felt that way when I started and I was in with certain people. I'm like I can't believe like my first credit was Phil Wickham response and that I was credited as like digital editor from this producer I was interning with mm -hmm. and that like meant the world to me. I was like, "Oh my gosh, like this is this is so cool." And then to go down the list after that of like, "Oh, people that I've looked up to, I got to work on their records." Like it it's just incredibly humbling to get to do that. <laughs> um very lucky to be in those circles. It's a lot of luck. Um but I I would think I would say s'mores. Okay, that's a valid. But if you're not in for the dessert thing, I think Wildberry is nice. That purple and... It's the sleeper. It's the sleeper. Not yeah. many people think about Wildberry. But still cookies and cream. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a very, I guess, unique sound in, in so many of those records. And I think it, it's I'm tapped into it because I'm listening to that type of music a lot. But, I mean, aside from that, what I want to approach, I want to talk about Atmos. Okay. Stuff's changing quickly in the industry. I just got to have an experience going down to LA and like actually sit in some of those rooms. I kind of come from the side of it thinking it was really gimmicky, think not really sure how like end user consumption worked. I guess from the standpoint of like, yeah, it's really cool that we can do these things. And we can immerse the listener in a very particular way. And it sounds killer to us, but I wasn't really sure how to control after it left my four walls or 11 speakers, however you want to say that. Mm -hmm. um, you working in it now for so long, right alongside having left and right mixes, binaural stuff, Atmos, 
how do you see the future of this playing out? How how do you view end user consumption? Mm -hmm. Is it a concern of yours? What I'll start with is when Atmos was kind of coming out, I remember seeing Andrew Masters' video of Axis Audio in Nashville. I'd kind of heard of Atmos before that, but I'd never seen anyone implement it. And then I saw that and I was like, what are they working on? Like, wh what's, where, what's the service and need for this? And then there were the rumors that started buzzing, like beginning of 2021. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hmm, maybe I should consider this. And then, uh, like, sure enough, Apple signs on. And I was like, there's going to be a giant vacuum in my circles for someone to do this. So I just pulled the trigger and got a system to do it all the while I'm still skeptical about it. Like, I'm like, I don't know how this is going to catch on. I don't know how people are going to listen to this. Um, but there's a need, you know, and I'm all about serving needs. Like, that's just my entire business is um, excellently, excellently solving problems to serve the needs of the client. When it, it even what, for the past, like, year and a half, two years that I've been in this, I've still been skeptical of like, well, how are we going to, how are we going to sell this to people? Because right now it's very Apple pushed. Like mm -hmm. Apple and Spatial are pushing this. Labels don't really care. They don't have the budget. They don't really want to do it. People don't like how it sounds in AirPods. Um, and who's going to spend the money on a room? Like there's a lot of, those are big hurdles to get over. But here's the big but is it sounds amazing in a room. It really does. Like Atmos in a room is a new experience. And it was hard listening to people who were trying to sell it. Like, oh, this is the most amazing thing in the world. And then you listen on AirPods and you're like, I can't believe you. Like, you're not credible anymore because it sounds like junk. Mm -hmm. And I was there because it does kind of sound like junk. They've gotten better with the algorithm. It does sound better now. Um, so the the consumer products weren't hadn't caught up yet to the technology. And I also was thinking about it like, uh, you know, here's your stereo mix. And then Atmos is is a next... I don't call it evolution, but it is another mix to do. Mm -hmm. And just recently in the past like month or two, probably two or three months, I've been developing a system to do those at the same time, which that gap between where the stereo is in our feeling, you know, you talked about feeling like it's the feeling has kind of always been there in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a faithful representation of the stereo in a room. But that's the problem. We're chasing stereo. And, and from a consumer standpoint, it's like pushing imax through an antenna tv like <laughs> it just it doesn't make sense right now but with consumer developments like the sonos or like the the sound bars and systems that are scalable where like i just want a sound bar or i want a sound bar and two speakers i want 10 and i'll pop them around my room and it'll calibrate that's when it's a win when it's real easily digestible and consumable by people and when they figure out hrtf uh, head-related transfer function to like map your head and how you hear things in space directionally. Mm -hmm. When you can pop on headphones or AirPods and they properly decode that, that's when it's going to be amazing in AirPods. Right now, it's been a compromise. So that gap between what you listen to in stereo on headphones and what you listen to as an Atmos mix in AirPods has been a gap. And what I've been trying to develop is a system to do stereo and Atmos at the same time, which and I'm not talking about mixing in Atmos using the stereo fold down because I still don't think that's there. We'll get better with our techniques. Like mm -hmm. the, the method and technique is a bit of the Wild West at the moment. <laughs> but over time, and, and what I've been developing, it gets real close to the, to the vision and the, the feel of stereo to the point where eventually I think we'll be mixing in Atmos and we won't be sacrificing or compromising that target of stereo that we've been so used to hearing. Like, it will get better, but I was thinking about it wrong. Like, I was thinking, here's the stereo mix, and there will be an Atmos mix. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, when they, when they went to multi-track recording, it was a new avenue for creative, um, or for creation, mm -hmm. right? Um, it was no longer one mic in the room, people standing around a mic, checking levels to tape. It was like, ooh, new possibilities. Stereo, it was wonky for a while, new possibilities, like, mm -hmm. but then we figured it out and it sounds great. So Atmos, I don't even, I don't want people to even think about Atmos. I don't want them to think stereo. I don't want them to think Atmos. The, it, the burden is on the engineer now to figure out how to best represent the song in any space. Like that's why we did a car test for years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like we do a car test to see how does this translate? 
So if mixers get better at mixing in Atmos, like who cares how people listen as long as it, it's good? Right now and for the, a while, it's not been good. It, it's not been a good experience in AirPods, which is people's primary primary avenue of listening. Mm -hmm. So it's a hard sell, but it's getting better and easier. And that bar is moving closer to on par with stereo. And as people think production in Atmos, like we put two mics over an overhead or two mics over a drum kit for an overhead, right? And we put some room mics out. But if people are thinking this is going to be an Atmos, you can configure microphones to fit the drums into a space differently than just stereo. Mm -hmm. And we double guitars, one on the left, one on the right. That's a technique, right? Yeah. Um, but now we have many places it can go. So is it, you know, one guitar part here, another guitar part here, a complementary, like I'm not saying add more parts, mm -hmm. but complementary and necessary for the song. Like, can we space it around us? Like the way that we think about it is going to change. And then no one's going to care if it was Atmos or stereo, just does it deliver on the vision of the song? So the techniques, we're working on it. We're working on figuring that out, and it's getting closer to how we feel about stereo. So to all those who are hesitant, like, oh, man, I don't want to jump on this bandwagon. Like, I hate the way it sounds, whatever. Digital sounded like junk when it first came out. That is true. But people, people worked, through, um, they, they worked through the junk to figure out how to make it better, and they learned the benefits. Like, oh, even though I'm sacrificing my comfortability or my workflow or the vibe of tape, I get all these benefits in the digital world. And the whole world shifted to DAWs. And now it's a novelty to work on tape. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying stereo will be a novelty because now I'm about to sound like the people that I was skeptical about. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is it shouldn't matter if it was stereo or Atmos because as this world is shifting and the amount of money getting pushed behind Atmos, immersive, spatial... Um, I don't think it's going away. And if it did, I'd be fine with it. Like sell mm -hmm. the gear, it's liquidatable, mm -hmm. whatever. But the techniques that you learn getting into Atmos, um, it, it's moving now. So getting into it and learning while that's shifting as opposed to being behind the, the shift, mm -hmm. um, I think that's going to be a benefit for people to get in, learn what not to do, <laughs> learn what to do. Um, fail all the way to the end, you know? <laughs> um, so as that shifts, uh, we're going to be getting better at the sound and then no one's going to care. Like they're just going to go, that's, that's a great sounding mix, mm -hmm. you know? And what's important about that is Apple, at least right now, turns things on automatically, like head tracking's on automatically, automatic Atmos playback on your phone and computer are on automatically. We just found that out yesterday with a dude who updated his computer, <laughs> buddy of ours, <laughs> who um, we were sitting there listening to stuff, and I was like, this is the Dolby mix. Like, it, he's only listening on two channels in stereo, but there's the Dolby icon up top, and I turned it off, and sure enough, boom, the stereo mix showed up. Like, that's not cool. That's, that's not cool to mix engineers who mixed in stereo and worked hard on it, and there's a, a Dolby Atmos mix that's getting, like, preferred over that if, for the time being, the Dolby Atmos is a compromise for stereo. I get why they're trying to push it, but this is also kind of why it's important for whoever makes the stereo, try to do the Atmos as well, because right now, like we're sacrificing and compromising a lot to try and push this new technology on people who don't care about it. Mm -hmm. And so it's important not to sneak it in without people knowing, they just know that they don't feel it. Like they don't, like I'm not connected to this song, I don't know why, and they're automatically being pushed the Atmos mix and they don't know it. And it's like, oh, this feels weird. Well, the engineer needs to make it not feel weird. And Apple needs to help, like, they need to help the engineers as well. Because that's how they were going to sell this. That's a long answer. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll I, let think, you continue. I think the thing with Apple that's pushing it so hard is the main turnoff, especially for those of us in the industry. It's like, okay, now you can't get playlisted. I mean, yeah. even, even as much as I like Atmos and the experiences that I've had up to this point, there are certain things that just don't work in Atmos. Or there's, mm -hmm. there's certain forms of the art that just don't make sense. Like, I would think of like a City and Color record. It's just a vocal and a guitar. Like, could you do it in Atmos? Y yes. Okay. Well, here, here's where I'd push back just on that. Okay. That the gatekeepers are screwing this up. 
And that's a that's a loaded statement because I don't want to get on their bad side. But I have had <laughs> I have had mixes kicked back because someone's using their eyes and not their ears. Well, what do you mean? Like you don't have enough information in the LFE channel, or mm, you're not using enough in the in the center channel. Like I see a lot of Atmos mixes now where there's not anything in the c- center channel, and there used to be a giant requirement that everything had to be used. Or like I get the minus eighteen thing, mm-hmm. that's cool. But oh, you're not using enough objects. You're not like you, they're watching the object window and then giving oh, the, you feedback they, on the mix based like based for on certain that? for certain labels and even Apple and the algorithm. There are QC people who open up that ADM and go out through a checklist that's like you don't have enough objects that are spread out between mid near far. Like all your objects are near. And it's like Ooh. that needs to be on the engineer to decide what's uh-huh. best for the song. So that's why I say we shouldn't care if it was mixed in Atmos or stereo, it's what's right for the song. So something that's guitar and vocal, like if someone wants to put it and mix it in mono, that should be the prerogative of the engineer. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't, a a gatekeeper should not be checking, you don't have enough information going on. Mm -hmm. Like, but does it sound good? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think those things actually breathe better in Atmos. Like if you, if you put something like small, small amounts it can sound amazing and intimate. Does it does it justify it to spend for a stereo mix and an outmost mix? Of course not. Like that's kind of dumb. That's not sustainable. But if engineers were doing both and there was this new format and they just they just did it and it was the best version of the song, who who cares how it was mixed? So <laughs> like I mixed a song for Matt Marr, um, where he recorded it in a in the woods. Okay. So there's a guitar, him and another vocalist. And there's cicadas going on. So, like, I found some cicada samples and threw them all around <laughs> and put, like, a little bit of, like, I think I did, like, an altiverb woods mm-hmm. uh, thing and threw it in the back. And you close your eyes and sit in the room and you're like, I'm in the woods with them right now. Like, it just, it feels that way. And okay. and so it it's not a gimmick if it's best for the song. And that's that's the point that hit home with me. And I guess my quick comment was short-sighted because the thing that I took away sitting in Atmos for the first time was the level of intimacy with the artist. That's just, it's not that it's, it's definitely there with left, right, but it's a whole different level with Atmos, Mm -hmm. especially, I mean, the vocal is dead center uh, and you have all this space. And And that's some of the things that we complain about or that we want back in engineering. I, I just did a master Mm-hmm. And I had uh, a hot version and a quiet version. My quiet version was minus nine luffs. <laughs> I don't even want to say what the one that got sent out was. It's loud. And that, not that that's wrong. Loudness can be a form of emotion, and there's definitely some validity to that. But some of the things that we get back with Atmos, dynamic range, all the space we could hope for, mm-hmm. it seems like a huge win for us. And even with the spatial audio and listening on AirPods, when I first got my AirPods, I noticed that was on by default. I didn't realize it would be on with two speakers, but Mm -hmm. putting those on for the first time and like turning my head, it was really off-putting and I did not enjoy it. Um, Now, when I go back and listen, I don't know if things changed or... The algorithm's definitely changed. Okay. Absolutely. Just, Just there is a... I definitely enjoy it now. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think when people say that it sounds like trash, they're either listening to bad mixes or they're missing that sauce, I guess, that comes from a left, right, where it's loud and they're just missing the fact that it's loud. Mm -hmm. Um, But being able to like physically turn your head and like hear these different aspects, it's not the same as sitting in a room, but I find it enjoyable. It's a different way to consume music. It is. And and I'll just re I'll harp on this again. It should be on the engineers to just make sure it sounds good in these formats. And some people don't have the tools to do it. They don't have the skill set or or techniques yet. Mm-hmm. And like I've been there. there before I did this template to do stereo and Amos at the same time and run things through uh, I'm processing about this template. But <laughs> uh, like you would have to detach things to an object, and it like. That's why you get this detached, unglued feeling. It's mm-hmm. like you're not processing it in the same way that you did stereo. So that makes sense. But like, let's work as engineers not to compromise that. Let's not compromise how it feels. So like, if it feels best for the song, 
then if it's an Atmos or stereo, it doesn't matter. Like mm -hmm. it should just sound good. So hopefully, hopefully the bar is moving closer to sounding good. I mean, in the room, it's always been great. So <laughs> yeah, I'm going to reset. The oh yeah. Yeah. I, like, I don't know how much I should share with this, but uh, one of the gatekeeper things that happened last week, like we got a mix kicked back three times because they were looking at the ADM and the song, like the music kind of fades out and there's audience clapping that keeps going. So mm -hmm. I had those on an object that continue to the rest of the song. So in Pro Tools, they blew up the, the waves to look and they got the stereo track up top. They see the rest of the beds and objects fade out except for this, you know, 15 and 16, which were crowds clapping. And they kept saying 15 and 16 don't fade the way that the rest of them do. And I'm like, use your ears. Like it does. Like just listen, flip between the stereo and the Atmos and it fades. You're just using your eyes and you're seeing these things fade out and you see this continue and you don't see it look like the stereo track. And so you're, t you're kicking it back because you don't think it fades out correctly. But like me and my mastering engineer triple checked it. Each time that you kicked it back, we're like, no, this fades out correctly. And, and so people are just using their eyes. To, uh, is that coming from like the label manager mm -hmm. side? That okay. Yeah, it's it's the labels and um, whoever's about to put it on Apple. I don't know if Apple does the QC quite like that, but I mean, I know that UMG and Sony and Warner and all this, they have a QC department that opens up this stuff and checks. That's interesting and horrifying at the well, same time. I I understand hitting certain uh, targets, mm -hmm. right? But at the end of the day, the discretion is at the engineer to make sure it sounds good. And if an engineer is ignorant of using near mid far, like, okay, they should learn, mm -hmm. but it should also be their choice to make it near mid far or off, like whatever is best for the song. No L LFE, cool, run with it. Mm -hmm. Like that's what we decided. So anyway. Well, and it's interesting you say that, that having them worry like there's not enough information in different spaces. One of the most striking tracks that I listened to was like a slow burn at most. Like it started very left and right mm -hmm. and then slowly came into the whole picture. So I could see them taking a look at that and going, no, you need to use more space. But that was what made that really cool. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> or it, In left and right, it's no different than us like writing that master in a creative way. Like, let's shrink the space and then blast yeah. it for the chorus. Well, ju just imagine if there was people at the label when stereo came out and that Beatles, the early Beatles stuff where it's like drums are on the right, bass is on the left, <laughs> a vocal is far left. And, and someone said, you can't do that. You, yeah. can't, you can't do it that way. Like, were those the wrong decisions? Probably. It doesn't, it doesn't sound good today. <laughs> Like, we listen to it today and we're like, oh, now that I notice that these are hard panned, like, I don't like this. But there's still Beatles records and Beatles songs that they decided where the, that went. And was it the wrong decision? Maybe, but we've got to make those mistakes. Mm -hmm. Like, they, the engineers and the artists get to decide how the song sounds. Mm -hmm. So let's quit with this, oh, it doesn't sound like the stereo or, oh, the Atmos doesn't have enough objects or... Like, let's just mix the song and make it sound good. Let's just have the decisions made and it will scale that, like the creative juices will be flowing as opposed to this checklist of like, okay, let's get it on the playlist. Let's, you know, let's do the bare minimum mm -hmm. so that we can get it on a playlist. I love that. Um, one of the pushbacks I see from engineers. Hey, hey. Yep, we're good. Okay. Um, one of the pushbacks I had on one of my videos when I was talking about going and listening to Atmos was that's great, but no one's going to install an Atmos room in their house. Yeah. I think that's a horribly silly argument because if we extrapolate that into our own recording studios, nobody's listening in a treated room with studio monitors. Right. And there has to be some middle ground there. Like, yes, clearly no one is going to install a ten thousand, thirty thousand dollar, fifty thousand dollar Atmos room to listen. Maybe some people will, mm -hmm. but I I struggle with that pushback, and I think I struggle because I really don't know the answer of how <laughs> how they can consume in an effective way. Mm -hmm. I did see Sonos's system, and it sounded great, and it was relatively affordable. Mm -hmm. And I mean, TVs are ready for Atmos, soundbars are ready for Atmos. I mean. 
what is it? The home pods are ready. Yep. Alexas are, are all ready. Like the stuff is there. Are you going to be listening in a studio environment? No, but that's not the part of it that's necessary. And I think that's hard to get over for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, my response to that questioner is, are you mixing in mono? <laughs> like, are, are you, are you mixing? Uh, I'm not trying to uh, put down anyone in their mixing space, but I just have to ask. Are you mixing in a bedroom? Mm -hmm. Are you mixing on prosumer under $1,000 speakers? I'm not pushing back. on. I'm not denigrating anybody mm -hmm. for that being their start or that's what they choose to do. I mean, look at Phineas and yeah. like all those guys. Okay? So what I'm saying is just make music. Like there are hi-fi guys who treat the consumer hi-fi people who put in giant towers. Like are we making music for them? Probably not. Um are most people and even me listening to songs with their iP iPhone on the counter? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. Like, it's always about the song. Forever, amen. It's always about the song. And it's just the engineer's do job to do the song justice and eliminate distractions, it, present it in the best light possible. So if people want to stay in stereo and do that, go for it. I just think the push of the industry is for Atmos. And so, again, it's a way to serve those people. Mm -hmm. um, do I think they're going to be left behind in stereo? I don't know. Like, I just I just want the mix to sound good. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So so I'm, I'm getting my reps in now, you know, like with Atmos, in case that's the way it continues. And, and even if Atmos yeah. sticks around, it seems like there is desire for something like we have technology in place to make whatever this listening experience is slightly different well it, that's also like saying we have tvs why do you need an oculus <laughs> yeah like be, because <laughs> someone invented an oculus and it kind of it's kind of cool <laughs> yeah like do i own oculus no have i ever done vr stuff do i want to put on vr and make videos for vr i don't probably not i can choose not to be a part of that world. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it is there opens up avenues for people to do that. So I don't like it's a giant hurdle for people to put speakers in their room. I get it. Like it's not fun to think about spending that much money mm -hmm. and and even thinking about compromise. You have to put a system together. There's probably some tiers of like bare minimum, the probably minimum necessary and then extravagant, right? Mm -hmm. Sky's the limit and that's daunting to think about. It's not fun to choose, like, I can only afford the, the low, low, low compromise now, or I can't even afford the low, low compromise right now. Mm -hmm. So all I've got to say to that is, like, keep making music. And, like, if you want to do logic with AirPods for now, like, you're flying blind a little bit, but you can get some reps in with decisions, um, try and test things out with people who do have a room, mm -hmm. um, or just... Put up speakers. Be re be renegade about it and go find some speakers to put up. It's going to sound like mismatched garbage. You have to delay time your speakers. Like, it's a must. Um, the EQ curve, eh, take, <laughs> take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. But throw some stuff up. Use Dolby's Dart Excel sheet to plug in your room dimensions, where to put the speakers. If you put them equidistant around your ears, that's most ideal. And just start. Just just try it. Just do it. Um so the, the buy-in is tough. And if consumers are ha have devices that can work in Atmos, I don't care if someone's listening on an iPhone or an Atmos home theater system. I don't care. Like, does the song sound good? I'm just here to serve the people who request, can I get the song mixed? And the reason I'm now trying to do it in stereo and Atmos at the same time is so that I can preserve the vision of the song like, I'm not compromising and chasing the stereo. Like, I'm creating the stereo, and at the same time, I'm making decisions about Atmos, and they're both going through the same processing together, and and hopefully what I deliver is just, it's it's just good. Like, that's the target. It's like, I, are you listening to the stereo or Atmos? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Does it sound good? Is this Is this the song? When I deliver you a mix, is that your vision for the song? No? Let's tweak it. Mm -hmm. Forget about what I'm working on. If I'm in the box or using the hardware, don't think about it. Just is this the song? Am I using analog tape or a DAW? Forget about it. Mm -hmm. That's that's now my position on Atmos. I love that thought process. It's it's a tool. 
you don't need to know that I built this house with a hammer or a nail gun. I or, built the house. <laughs> or or one of those machine, I don't know, you, you can edit that out. <laughs> like what are, those machines that ooze out. Yeah, You've seen those? The 3D printer the three, houses. The 3D printer house. What does it matter? <laughs> it's there. It's a house. It's a house. Choose it or don't choose. Buy it or don't. Like <laughs> if someone wants to create that way, awesome. Let's do it. Well, let me see. We've got some questions here okay. and I want to make sure we get to these. Yeah, yeah. You can also chop out any of that. You can make two videos as. I don't Oh man, I think this is gold. I'm I'm real long-winded with this stuff. No, I love it. This style of video is like I would lo- I would listen to this. Well, what's funny is I've been in Atmos for 2 years and I feel like just a month or two ago I became a believer. Like explain that. Well, because I've been skeptical. I've been skeptical that Atmos is going to catch on. I've been skeptical that it's going to sound good for consumers. I've been skeptical that the budgets are sustainable until I saw that it was possible to combine this template and method and workflow. And then it's like, oh, um, we've made it better. We've made it more efficient. We've made it better. Those those unattainable, like unsustainable, bad quality, whatever the negatives are. And, and consumer products are now coming out, right? Mm-hmm. We've We've now worked on those uh worked on those things so now it's like oh this is doable so i'm i'm now i'm now a i don't want to say an evangelist word but i now believe that it's possible like for for a while i was just serving the need Mm -hmm. i'm like okay it's gonna be here whatever going through the motions but but now like i just don't want to compromise anymore i want to figure out the problems like any engineer should do (laughs) figure out the problems and problem solve and you'll get better on the other end of it so i don't know I'm going to need to steal that template when you're not looking. <laughs> well, eventually I'm going to re- release it. I'm trying to work out a video of how to how to uh, show it to the world. So that You're going to give away a lot if that's the case, man. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, let's get to some questions here. Um, so Vance Fight asks, uh, maybe this is an ignorant question, but I'm actually super curious about what different use cases for Atmos are going to be. Will there be a pragmatic impact on mixing music? Or are all use cases predominantly for film, immersive environments, or is it something that will impact down the road and people are just now jumping on early? I know technically AirPods have spatial audio, but I have yet to hear anything that makes me want to use it. So it's hard to imagine that standard consumers are going to rush to it. There's yeah. a lot there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I, I feel like some of that was answered before, mm-hmm. but the quick answer is consumers don't care. Does the song sound good? Mm-hmm. So if you're going to mix in stereo, make it sound good. If you're going to mix in Atmos, make it sound good. I just see the trend and the money pushing for Atmos. So I I hate sounding like a fear monger, but it really does look like those who don't jump on Atmos will be left behind in certain ways. Like they'll be limited. I'll say that their reach for a song will be limited. If Apple is preferring Atmos mixes then for playlists, then those stereo mixes are going to get pushed to the side. And you can be okay with that. Mm-hmm. Like, you can still mix in stereo, and good on you. But just know, like, the industry is moving, whether or not you like it. I didn't like it. Like, mm-hmm. I got into it, and I didn't like it. For a year and a half, I didn't like it. <laughs> so now that I've, I'm developing a system... I'm starting to like it more because I see the possibility and the potential. And maybe that's what everyone's pushing back on right now is they don't see the potential. They listen in AirPods and they're like, I don't get it. But they stop there, right? If you if you dig in and try to mix on your own or, or throw together a hodgepodge Atmos system or go to a room and listen and just see what's possible, work through in your head, like, how could I do this? Would this serve my clients? Like that, that's when it's possible. It's like, does it serve, does it serve your clients? Are they asking for Atmos? Probably not. Like, unless you're working for labels, they're probably not asking for Atmos. Mm -hmm. Um, Could you get reps in with an indie artist who doesn't know the difference? Yeah. Like you could, you could get your Atmos chops going before it matters for you to get label stuff or people who are asking for Atmos specifically. Um, So, I mean, do it or don't do it. Like, Mm -hmm. It, it doesn't matter except if the industry moves on, like you're kind of in the dust or you're kind of behind mm-hmm. on it. So I don't want to f- fear monger in that way, but that that's just the reality. Like, does it serve your clients? Again, are you mixing in mono? You can do it. Go mm-hmm. for it. If you just have a mono speaker, an aura tone, like, you know, no mm-hmm. high end, no low end. Can you mix a record? Yeah, do it. Like, does it compete? I don't know. Does it sound good for the song? Mm-hmm. Like, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. 
<laughs> so I, I feel so nihilistic with the way I'm <laughs> no, saying I, all this. But. I love that everything's just coming back to, hey, who cares what I'm doing? Does the song sound good? And yes. I love that approach, and I feel like that's so, what's easy. So that sentiment is currently it doesn't, mm-hmm. and I get it. We understand that. We get it. We're trying to make it better. So watch videos. Watch watch as that line moves and listen to how people are doing it. We were just uh, this this video was out for a year and I hadn't watched it. I've been I'd keeping my head down and working. And there's an Andrew Shep's panel of five guys and they're talking about Amos. It's four and a half hours long, but it's great. It is fantastic. Anyone who's trying to get into Atmos, just watch all four and a half hours of that. Set aside a whole day so that you can take notes and listen to what these guys are saying. And even since then, a year ago when this came out, the line and the quality and the techniques have moved. So just stay up to date and you'll see that it's possible. When you see that it's possible, you went to a room, you listened, you Mm -hmm. heard that it's possible, your mind will start, well, your mind could change. It may not. You may be like, eh, I don't, it's still gimmicky. Mm-hmm. Whatever. I don't know. Do you have a tube television? <laughs> like, th- there are flat screens now because they're ubiquitous now. Mm-hmm. Will Atmos become ubiquitous? I don't know. But I'm getting my reps in now. I love that. So. so, okay, here's one from Mark Watson. I'm building a house from scratch. It will include a home studio for me. It'll be my office as well. It's about 18 by 15, no windows, doing a bunch of double wall, green glue, soundproofing. Mm -hmm. Now I'm wondering, do I need an Atmos room? It will be way more home than studio, so that's not super professional. I just don't want to be the guy buying a two-inch tape machine two months after ADAC comes out. Mm, I think his head's in the right space. Mark, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mark, your head's in the right space. Um, I think this goes for a lot of things in life that you build in the capacity before you need that thing. So like, I don't know, like even if you don't want to pull the trigger on an Atmos thing now, put in receptacles on the ceiling. Like run, if you don't even want to run lines, run empty conduit (laughs) so that you can get up in the ceiling or at least have a plan for it. I didn't. Like I, I finished out my studio space at the end of 2020 and then beginning of 2021, I thought about Atmos. Like there's no lines or anything run. So I had to retrofit that, Mm -hmm. but it's not as complicated as people think to retrofit it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think your dimensions are great. I'll just say that like 15 by 18, really 15 by 19 is a better Bonello curve. I'm not going off on an acoustical (laughs) tangent, but I'll say treat it more than you think, put in the capacity for more and then just see where it goes. Easy enough. If you build it, they will come, (laughs) right? That's, That's the field of dreams thing. And that and okay, and that leads to another question. Do you like if somebody were to put in a room, mm-hmm. given that they're a, a decent mixer, they have a decent background, is there actually work to be had? So a, a lot of people call this the Wild West, mm-hmm. right? There had to be those people who took the gamble and the risk to go out west first. Mm-hmm. Was there anything there? No. Was there gold there? Yes. So if if there's, are you going to find the gold? Not guaranteed. Like some people are going to find it, some don't. If you're not in a central hub of making music, you might be getting less work. Mm -hmm. Like if you're in Nashville, there's more opportunity because it's there. If you're in New York, LA, whatever, Seattle, wherever the hubs are of making music, you're just around more to get that work. Um, If you're somewhere else, that might be a limitation of how much work you're getting. So if you put in an Atmos room and you're like, well, where's the work? It's then work on building your circles, work on getting more work, um, get your get your reps in for Atmos um, while it's lower risk or just or just don't like it's OK. <laughs> I, love it. I just know that you, there are people who have to be the first ones. Mm-hmm. And do you want to be one of the first ones? Like maybe that matters to people. Maybe it doesn't. Hmm. So I love the approach. I love the thought process. Thank you for talking about this. Yeah. I feel like we could talk way longer Uh, you mean i could be long-winded way longer (laughs) oh have you watched my videos (laughs) um no i appreciate this thank you for coming and talking i hope we can talk again maybe when i get a little further down the atmos road i'll check in with you and be like how bad am i doing dude but zoom in anytime or come hang in nashville absolutely let's do that